The presentation that I am going to give today is called Micronesia's Digital Opportunity and Analysis. And this presentation is coming about as a result of several months now of conversations with colleagues of uh, assisting in drafting some pending legislation here in the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, where I am based. And it represents a framework that has been discussed with uh, several stakeholders from various areas of the region. And I wanted to put it all in one place because it's been kind of disparate and it's just been a matter of conversation. I think it's very, very valuable and an opportunity to move forward at a time when the economic situation here in the region is getting pretty dire. And I think that this is a, a really an outlook that can give us some great hope in showing us actually where we stand, which is a lot further along in terms of beginning a new economic activity than we may have thought. Um, why am I qualified to to give this talk. Um, this is about a digital opportunity and a, an emerging digital economy. I've been for the last 20 years involved in software and particularly the what, what you would call the tech industry, the internet based industry. For the last 10 years of that, I have been focused, my professional efforts have been focused in the world of uh, blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, distributed ledgers, Bitcoin, specifically building payment networks and working on protocols, I have established several businesses as well as have contracted with businesses, both large established businesses in the industry and startups. I've been a bona fide resident of the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands here in the Micronesia region for nearly four years now. And since being here, I have established several companies and have spent quite a bit of time going through the very unique and I think quite powerful legislative frameworks that have been established over the last 50 years here in the region, particularly in the last 25 years with the emergence of the independent states of Palau, Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. So here we go. This is a moment that comes along once in a generation. Not every country gets it every generation, but there comes a moment when there's a global shift, a global economic shift, and certain countries, due to the circumstances of where they are at, either geographically, politically, uh, demographically, are able to maximize and take advantage of the situation. And very, very often, the way in which these countries or nations or people groups are able to leverage a situation is that they, because the economic situation is what it is and a paradigm is shifting, those things that had previously looked like weaknesses to them actually turn out to be their greatest strengths. And with the, the newly emerging digital economy, and I'm going to call this a digitally native economy that is newly emerging. Some people refer to it as Web3. This has been kind of a shorthand for this. Uh, I do believe that this is a moment for this particular region just because of the, the historical situation that we find ourselves in, where we are politically, and also where we are in terms of things that have been done, let's say, over the last five years, independent of this, that will enable us to, to take advantage and, and leverage the situation. So what I'm going to talk about in this particular talk is it's going to consist of six parts. The first part is going to be a little discussion of the challenge that is in front of us and what this digital revolution really is. Then we'll talk about the current state of affairs, which is always important. Where do things stand currently? We'll take a look at a case study that I think really illustrates in concrete terms what the opportunity is for nations in the region and how already 
one of those nations, Palau, is looking like the, the front runner and can really give us some examples of what is possible and what the opportunity is. Uh, then, then next, we're going to talk about a case for cooperation between the particularly four nations that I want to focus on, which is Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, and Marshall Islands. And of course, these four now countries were once uh, controlled as a single entity called the Trust Territories after World War II, and more uh, broadly known just as Micronesia during that time. So uh, there has not been huge cooperation since independence 20 years ago, almost 30 years ago now. But I do believe that that this will provide a vision for a reason for that cooperation to come back. Uh, cooperation that has been there since ancient times for those who know the the history of the region. There has been that sort of connection. Um, and so then next we will talk about a, a, vision, a vision of what uh, digital success would look like and then a conclusion of, of what steps can be taken to move forward. So the very first thing that I want to discuss is the challenge of the emergent digital economy and the foundation of a digital revolution. So we're going to talk about really defining what this digital revolution that I'm talking about is. So the challenge that is presented right now to all of the countries in the region, the, the four that we're going to focus on, has been especially pronounced in the last three years because of the fact that all of these countries shut down to a great degree because of the global COVID situation. And still, uh, it is it is not we are not fully emerging back out. There were obviously shutdowns of uh, shipping and also transportation during that time. A lot of that has not come back online. Tourist habits have changed, as have various alliances, especially between the largest uh, patron of those four nations, the United States and the closest and most important uh, economic partner, which is China, that now there is antagonism. Let's not cut out Russia either. It's also much closer, actually, to uh, Vladivostok is uh, quite a bit closer to the region than is anywhere that is uh, truly under a U.S. flag besides Guam. Uh, certainly than any other U.S. state. Hawaii is quite a distance away from uh, from the region. And so since its, its inception and its participation in the global economy, there have been problems that I am going to call the four P's of physical. So those of us who live here are fully well aware of this. I'm not saying anything new. Um, first of all, the first P is proximity that Micronesian nations, they really aren't particularly close to anything, like not particularly. Uh, ex Palau might be a little bit of an exception and it's, it's proximity to Philippines, but still uh, they really aren't particularly close to anything except each other. And yeah, even historically, even into the uh, uh, pre-colonial times, there has been quite a bit of uh, communication of people and goods between these islands. And even after uh, colonial times, we see movement of people, for instance, here in Saipan, where I am a resident, the Carolinian people came 250 to 200 years ago, they came by canoe, and they have been here ever since from the Caroline Islands. So that has been the case that Proximity to everywhere else has been difficult, but proximity to each other has been uh, a reality. Uh, the second P that's a problem is population. So these nations that we're talking about are among the least populated sovereign nations in the world, which necessarily means that you are going to have a very tiny native tax base. That's just the case. So... Um, governments trying to raise money, what we see now, especially 
in uh, these economic hard times is that governments, as they do, will often turn to taxing the people to try to get more revenue, especially considering that government is a major, major employer. And that's really difficult to do. That's squeezing blood from a stone simply because the population is so small and there's not a lot more taxes that can be had. Uh, the, the third P is also related to that, and I, I'm labeling this as professions. And because we have a small population uh, across the region, and because uh, we don't have, let's say, a plethora of institutions of higher education, that uh, skilled professionals who, you know, tend to earn a significant amount of money relative to other people in the population, I'm talking about doctors, lawyers, et cetera, if they are from the local population, they have those individuals have left usually to go to school, usually in the U.S. mainland, which all of the residents and citizens of the nations in question are able to do. Uh, many of them do not come back. So when there is a need for doctors and lawyers, accountants, etc., they are often imported from other places, generally from the mainland. And often they are on short-term contracts with no intention of staying for a long time. Thankfully, some of them uh, do stay for a long time, particularly true with lawyers and CNMI, uh, but not always. And certainly not true with, uh, with doctors. They rotate in and they rotate out, which can make it very difficult to establish a, a skilled economy. And then the fourth P that's a problem is production. There's These are island nations. There's limited area. And so uh, limited commercial acreage. There have been some exceptions in terms of production. Uh, for one example would be the 90s here in Saipan and the garment industry. But as our governor has recently pointed out, with that having been a mostly Chinese-driven economy and with now China being cut out by by the U.S. from being able to participate in the economy here, it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to see that kind of physical production ramp up anytime soon in any of the, uh, the nations of the region. And uh, digital actually presents some benefits that I'm going to call the, the four R's of digital that really answer the four P's of physical. So when it comes to proximity, uh, the first R is real time. This is something that we've seen in the emergence of Zoom. Instant interaction in the digital realm, no matter the distance. So it really, if I'm on a Zoom call, I could be on a Zoom call, as does happen sometimes, where I have people participating in the call who are on island here, and I have people participating who are halfway around the world in the States or in Europe. And the difference between my interaction with either of them is the same. So this distance and this idea of proximity is really made, it's made moot. Um, so then we have a situation of also um, our population, our population being uh, small. But in this case, uh, I, the, this R is robotic. So we actually don't need in a digital economy, we don't need uh, a, a large workforce because many things can be automated. As a matter of fact, most things can be automated. And so the, the manpower need is not there, which is of a great benefit to a place that has a small population and not a lot of manpower. Uh, the third R here is really uh, related to our, uh, our professions. So uh, this is remote. This is the most probably important part, is that in a digital economy, economic actors, most importantly taxpayers, can be anywhere. So that is to say that businesses can be operating, people can be generating income, it can be sourced in the, the country or the commonwealth, taxes can be paid, and yet these individuals never had to touch down they didn't take up any infrastructure. They didn't have a footprint. Uh, and instead, all that they did was they, they directed money, uh, taxes especially, into the coffers of the government. 
Uh, and then the, the fourth R is about uh, our production P, and this is a return on investment. And that is to say that it's also related to this idea of a footprint. Digital businesses can scale globally to have millions of customers who are generating revenue with minimal infrastructure. And that infrastructure does not have to be, in this case, within the nation that we're talking about. It can be in the cloud, actually managed somewhere else. And so again, we don't have a, a bottleneck in terms of infrastructure, be that land, be that uh, electrical infrastructure, be that the same infrastructure that we would need for an industry like tourism, uh, you know, these CNMI could never support, Saipan could never support a million tourists at one time on the island. A Palau could not support a million tourists at one time uh, in, in Palau, in the Republic. But a, a Palau-based digital business could very easily support a million customers at one time on a given site or a given app, and it would have no impact on, on Palau and no impact on the infrastructure of, of Palau. So that's something that's very different. And one of the main things that's, that's attractive about a digital economy. Now, one of the things that uh, we will touch on is just how important sovereignty is in this whole, in the whole mix of what we're talking about. What is sovereignty's role? Uh, Many countries are not going to be able to be the front runners of this new digital paradigm shift, and it's because they just won't be able to move fast enough. We've got Web3 emerging, and really it's going to take nimble governments. If, you're, if you want to take advantage of being the playing field for these businesses, and most importantly, getting their taxes and fees for doing so, your, the, the legal frameworks have to be there for them. The support has to be there for them. And most countries, large countries especially, just they're behemoths. They have momentum and they are not thinking like this except for a few people in the vanguard. But it's very hard for those people to get legislation passed. So legislative frameworks have to be built. Uh, Public-private partnerships have to be established. This is obviously going to be much easier with fewer stakeholders involved and um, countries that don't have a lot of, of overhead and vested interests and special interests that are, that are involved and that are trying to play a role. And the other part about it is that because these nations are small, the revenue that's generated can be of immediate benefit to citizens and it, and it isn't lost in the mix mix it can and this can really be a focus and an important thing to understand or to remember about sovereignty is that of course the degree of sovereignty and individual recognition that you have is independent of a country's size what do i mean by that i mean that the palau passport as a passport is as valid of a passport as the polish passport as the portuguese passport as the panamanian passport um each of them also has one vote in the United Nations. And so this is something that's important to recognize, that the size of the country really doesn't have a bearing on the validity of the sovereign acts that are taken within that country. That's going to be important as we, as we look forward at what we're talking about here. So if we're looking at any economy, really, we've got three main economic components, if the government is going to play a role, there are three things that a government is going to do. Uh, the president of Palau, we, I was recently in Palau, uh, was lucky enough, blessed enough and honored enough to uh, hear several presentations from the president, both in private and in public. Uh, Suranyal Whips Jr., the president of Palau. And one of the things that he repeated over and over that I really, really liked was he said, really, government's job, and he's an entrepreneur, uh, he said, government's job is to provide a playing field for the citizenry to be able to prosper. And so the, the playing field that governments provide and that is important now in a digital, a global digital economy that looks a little bit different, not totally different, uh, in in form, a little bit different, 
the economic components are number one, a registry. So this is individual identity. We're talking passports, driver's license, et cetera, social security, et cetera, and corporate registry and business licensing. So this is both incorporating business licenses, et cetera. The second thing is, of course, currency. Uh, this is a financial system. Traditionally, this is going to be the banking system, but it's also the issuance of currency that allows point of sale payment, settlement between businesses, and uh, infrastructure for collecting taxes. And to do this in a digitally native way is going to change everything, and it's a role that Micronesia can play. And then the third thing is, of course, financial services. By this, we're talking about attorney services, attorneys, uh, accounting and insurance. And these are all things that are obviously regulated by governments, and it's important that they are regulated by governments. We're talking about everything from the bar to uh, insurance commissions and regulatory agencies uh, and accounting accreditation, et cetera, et cetera. So those three components are a possibility here in Micronesia. So here's the current state where we currently are. Believe it or not, there is actually a pretty good baseline uh, foundation in effect at the moment. Um, as we said, there's those three components of a registry, currency, and financial services. So in terms of residency, Palau has a very innovative, up and running digital residency program. I am actually a Palau digital resident. And this was one of, one of the reasons why I was able to uh, interact with the president when we were there in the way that we did. There was a, a special ceremony for digital residents. In terms of a registry, this is Marshall Islands is a, is a world leader in shipping registries. It actually has the third most ships registered on the Marshall Islands ship registry after Panama and I believe Hong Kong. But they also have a corporate registry that is managed by the, the same private partner that manages their ship registry, and that is called IRI. I believe it's a international, international Registry Incorporated. And they have just established a decentralized autonomous organization, otherwise known as DAO. This is a blockchain-based business, uh, completely runs on the blockchain. They have a DAO LLC law that they've put through and a company called MyDAO, that is managing that in the same way that IRI was managing the others. Uh, insurance, little known that a Federated States of Micronesia actually has a captive insurance industry that is serving Japan. Captive insurance is a very interesting style of insurance that is becoming ever more important in the digital sphere. Basically, it's when instead of getting an outside insurance company, a company builds an insurance company as a wholly owned subsidiary of their company. This is something that's very popular with, cor with large corporations. Uh, but what has emerged out of this is something called a digital risk exchange, where a captive insurance company acts as a sort of an exchange. It's digital. Some of these, this stuff is taking place on the blockchain currently, and they can actually sell off their risk. They can tokenize their risk and sell it off. It's very, very interesting. And it certainly is an opportunity for FSM uh, to, to play a role in a fully digitally native insurance uh, scheme or, uh, or protocol. And then the last thing is the currency, which Palau is exploring a stable coin. I, I do not to be honest, I, th I think it's a, a worthy exercise that they're going through, but I don't think that they are well equipped to to really be the ones who are doing a uh, digital public virtual currency that can support a large scale digital industry. And the reason why that is, is because their banking system is not, it's not great. Uh, even when I was there, there were, there were issues with uh, 
some of Palau's uh, ATMs and whatnot. CNMI, on the other hand, has for its size a very robust banking system, along with some very unique locally chartered banks like Bank of Saipan and uh, City Trust that are non-FDIC, uh, privately insured, and thus are able to do some very creative things. For instance, Bank of Saipan banks our cannabis industry, which is Getting banking for a cannabis business has been something that has been quite elusive throughout the United States, very difficult to do. Uh, but CNMI has that capability. And there are also here we have uh, an application whereby we can immediately use a public virtual currency. And that is in the gaming space, not to mention the cannabis space. So that gives a, a bootstrap for for a public virtual currency. I think CNMI is the place. We actually have drafted legislation and it is outstanding and hopefully will be will be voted on and adopted and we can get rolling with this. And I think that that would that would really round out the the total offering between the, the four and it would give us the foundation for a digital economy. Why is there a disconnect? Why has this not been been discussed? Well, first off, I don't think anybody really is even talking about the fact that these are the pieces of a digital economy. Um, nobody's really tried to find any synergies between the things that are going on. So hopefully this is the beginning of that. And then part of the reason why that is, is that a lot of this is hap happening in a silo. As far as we can tell, my colleagues and I, there is not an existing framework for the stakeholders of Micronesia at at least the finance minister level, but even at the head of state level, to even begin to have the conversation about uh, banding together to try to build a digital economy or any economy, to be quite frank, uh, for Micronesia in collaboration. So there is a disconnect, and that's the way that things are right now. So I mentioned Palau. It's really the front runner in all of this. And it's through Palau's digital residency program that th a lot of this has really become clear to me. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about this. W what's going on in the established, developed Western nations when it comes to Web3, let's say the future, the digital economy that's coming, is the innovators in the space are really not wanting to even or, or are unable because of risk to even participate in the, e the US, EU, UK, Australia, etc. This is a, an email that I got from Coinex, an exchange I had been using for a very, very long time, dated February 25th, 2023. And in it, they're basically saying that they're no longer going to support US customers. And you know things must be bad when a company actively doesn't want U.S. customers and is even going to terminate. They said, take all your money out because we're going to terminate all the U.S. accounts. And the reason why is because U.S. regulators are so far behind on this and the, the in, inmates are so running the asylum that it's just too much of a risk for these companies that are legitimate companies that are doing their best to... Uh, stay within regulations who have robust know your customer laws to prevent and anti money money laundering laws, uh, but they just can't they just can't operate with the risk that the U.S. could at any time do something weird and those regulators crack down on them. This has gotten to such uh, uh, this is these are literally from today as I record this, which is uh, September fourteenth, twenty twenty three. As you can see, I just went to Google News and I just typed in SEC crypto. And these were like in the top five. So Coinbase says SEC is costing the U.S. millions of jobs and pushing opportunities offshore. Coinbase, the biggest exchange in the U.S. The, the CEO of Ripple, who, who, by the way, are actually trying to help Palau with their stablecoin project. Uh, he says crypto startups should avoid the U.S. And this is also true for EU, UK, Australia. They're, they're all sort of following each other. Canada. This is terrible. The, the U.S. is really, I mean, the U.S. has been the leader in tech. You figure Silicon Valley, and they are basically abdicating the throne and the opportunity to pick it up. As you could see, what it's about is it's about 
uh, business friendly and digitally native friendly regulation. Businesses are looking for a place to go and individuals. So Palau is poised to be one of the big winners in this whole thing, regardless of if a, a broader digital economy protocol is put together, initiative is put together. As I said, I'm a digital resident. What does this allow? It allows, even though I'm a US citizen, it allows for me to go and register on CoinEx, for instance. But when I register, I'm able to, it's, I'm a legal resident. I'm a legal digital resident by law of Palau. I can register as a resident of Palau and CoinEx says that's perfectly fine because they're reporting to and their liability to uh, my sovereign nation that is representing me is to Palau. And Palau has said, we believe that you should be able to go and trade cryptocurrency if you want to trade cryptocurrency. Uh, if you're not a criminal and Palau obviously does uh, know your customer anti-money laundering checks beforehand uh, to make sure that people are not uh, sanctioned, to make sure that they are not criminals, which I am not. And in this case, everybody is happy. So you can imagine it's well worth the $250 a year for me to be able to have free reign in the digital economy. And in that regard, I would much rather be a resident of Palau for those purposes than a resident of, of the United States, which imagine that that is so weird. What a, what a paradigm shift. Yeah, but this gives us an example of, of what is on the horizon and what's coming. So what will it mean to collaborate? That's the key here. Palau's got a digital residency, obviously, but that's just one component of an economy. We would like, look, we would like CoinEx to be established in Micronesia, right? Not established somewhere else, but established in Micronesia and accepting uh, Palau digital residents as well and using the insurance that is coming from FSM for, for uh, insuring their company and using the public virtual currency that is coming from CNMI. So what does that collaboration look like? You would imagine something like this, the Micronesian Protocol. It's company D, this could be for digital, decentralized, but it's like as though we were talking about, let's say, an exchange, a CoinEx. So it could go all the way into a fully Micronesian Protocol would be possible. So... First off, Dow LLC, so they're incorporated in Marshall Islands as a company. That's where they are based. The KYC, the Know Your Customer Anti-Money Laundering checks that they're going to do, Palau already does this. That's sort of the wonderful things that they're offering. They've already KYC'd all of their digital residents. So then you, the, a company can just tap in to the public information that they have, and they can get that back. So in this case, this company may even say, oh, well, we only take customers who are Palau uh, digital ID holders. And this is not altogether different from the way that, let's say, accredited investors, uh, where we have restricted investment opportunities to accredited investors. In this case, it could be uh, restricted to Palau DID holders, which means that we don't have to worry about the regulatory weirdness of the US and other Western countries as they're doing it. Uh, then there's also the financial component where uh, they, this company could take payment and do their payment processing in the CNMI public virtual currency, have a bank account in CNMI and do all of their financial uh, business from out of here. And they could have an FSM captive insurance digital risk exchange whereby they were selling their own insurance, getting obviously the best rates uh, premium wise and also the best benefits and them able to manage their own risk. This could be done on the blockchain or with another digital platform as well. So this is what it, it would give to the company, which is pretty awesome. And in collaborating and having this all, everybody gets a little, all the, all the people get a little bit to their government. So the Dow LLC, the cost of that is uh, 3000 to $15,000 initially. $2,000 to $5,000 per year that this company is going to pay. Look, $3,000 per year to be able to have this, this legal entity that is unique in all of the world, that is really owned by no one, but is managed by these tokens that are online, a very futuristic way of doing it, is quite, quite advantageous. You know, it's offshore. These are the same types of companies that are going to Palau, to Estonia, uh, et cetera. 
could do this right here in Marshall. And if it's tied in, you sort of get everything. The uh, and that that's money that goes to Marshall items. Um, on the digital ID front, it's two hundred fifty dollars per year per individual. Uh, that is paid to Palau. Right now, Palau has uh, about 10,000 digital residents who are paying this amount. So that's $2.5 million a year to Palau, basically just to do background checks on people and to issue IDs. Pretty incredible to run the infrastructure there. And that's that can, again, this can scale easily to millions of digital residents. And most of these people have never and will never uh, go to Palau. They're not interested in that. They're interested in uh, buying or paying for Palau's sovereignty. So Palau, even the president had said this, and the fi their finance minister, when I was there a few weeks ago, had said that really their biggest resource, their natural resource, is their sovereignty. And it's an important way to start looking at this. Um, to use the public virtual currency, you know, $300 in uh, business license per year, this would be a foreign company with an authorization to, uh, to do business, a certificate of authorization to do business in CNMI. Uh, that's how they would be able to get a bank account. Obviously, they would need to have that. And then processing fees on every transaction. So again, this absolutely scales for CNMI. We've got businesses that would never need to come here besides to maintain uh, you know, a mailing address and perhaps a, a, a virtual physical address and yet this would be money going to the cnmi government and then the same thing goes for the license fee for a captive insurer which is 500 dollars license fee per year to marshall islands so this is a business that is paying everybody in the region uh and yet it still is a steal i mean at most we would be talking about you know five thousand dollars per year or so maybe six and that would be a very large company. That would be a company that could scale to, to an, an incredibly large size, and yet they would be fully equipped to operate in a global digital economy and be protected uh, by the laws and accredited by the laws, licensed by the laws of the nations in question. So this is sort of the mix. Everybody brings a little something different to the table. Um, in Palau, you can't incorporate with foreign members, but you can in, uh, in the other three. Uh, you. As in terms of a fully foreign owned corporate domicile, and by uh, I mean a full domicile, so that's including a bank account, which you, by the way, cannot do in Marshall Islands. So they only anymore have the Bank of Marshall Islands, and the Bank of Marshall Islands will not bank a foreign owned corporation. So even though you do have the Dow LLC, you're going to need to have banking somewhere else. This is really only possible in FSM and CNMI, uh, but particularly CNMI has the laws to be able to do it in a, a very expedient way. Um, full residency for U.S. citizens. Obviously, CNMI is under a U.S. flag. If you're a U.S. citizen, you could just come here, live and work. No problem. No need for visa. But uh, if you are a digital resident, you get 180 days on basically a, a tourist visa. You get half a year in Palau. So it does give a great opportunity for digital nomads. So for individuals, it's a great place. So you could be living in Palau six months out of the year and CNMI maybe the other six months out of the year, be a CNMI resident and, and also be spending time in uh, beautiful Palau if you were establishing a business in the region. So it's, it, that's really great. So here's the, the conclusion and the next steps that I think uh, can be done, really that would need to be done to establish this. Um, the first thing is the public virtual currency and integration with banking and CNMI over the next two years. We're working hard on that. So hopefully the uh, Internet Casino Act that we've presented that enables a virtual currency can be can be brought forward and put into place. FSM has not had introduced into the captive insurance market. Um, into their industry, has not had digital risk exchanges introduced. They're relatively new. There's actually in the, the latest um, Y Combinator uh, startup class, there is a digital risk exchange called CatX, I believe. And uh, this is really primed. I, I certainly hope that this can move forward. And I'm sure we'll begin conversations about that in the coming year. And then we need to... Start, begin the establishment of 
the that idea of a Micronesian exclusive company, this idea where you have a company that is based in Micronesia, but then is only going to accept Palau digital residents as customers. This could be an exchange. I don't know what this is going to be, but it solves a huge regulatory problem. So I would hope that in 2024, someone gives this a shot as a first mover. It really will. I do think that this is the protocol. And I do think that this is the opportunity to, to really scale and to move beyond tourism and into a brand new digital economy for Micronesia. Unique, unique opportunity. So thank you. That's it. If you got questions, vin at badger.cash. I look forward to updating on, on these things as we move forward and working on this for in, in the coming years, because I really do think this is a unique opportunity. It's a unique moment. And I thank you for, uh, for listening. And I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.